Good evening and welcome to News Center at 930. I'm Casey Caval. And I'm Chad Walling. The Delaware County Smoking Task Force met today to discuss the smoking ban. They talked about the language of the Delaware County Smoking Act. After the act is written, the task force will present it to the county commissioners. The act will give restaurants the option of eliminating smoking or making the smoking area more confined. One Muncie resident feels there is a strong backing in the community to ban smoking in restaurants altogether. As our rest restaurants are set up, it's impossible for the restaurant to honor the smoker's right to smoke. And at the same time, even though they set aside a portion for non-smokers, they can't honor my right not to ingest the smoke. The Smoking Task Force will meet again on April 22nd at 3 p.m. at the White River Landing. The gubernatorial campaign is underway for Luke Kenley. Indiana Senator Kenley visited Ball State today to share his political views with students. We had the opportunity to speak with him at Teachers College earlier today. And the case of a Marion businessman accused of cheating investors of more than $20 million has taken a new twist. Um, excuse us for the technical difficulties with the lights. It'll be just one second. Attorneys appointed to recover fugitive Philip Ferguson's assets are looking to evict his wife. The 52-year-old Ferguson disappeared in June of 2000 while his investment business was under investigation. He has been charged with 89 counts of security violations and is currently wanted by the FBI. The police in Bloomington are urging basketball fans to celebrate without violence tonight as Indiana plays for its sixth national title. About 65 officers are expected to patrol campus as thousands of Hoosier fans gather at Assembly Hall to watch tonight's game. Fans filled the streets near campus on Saturday night when IUB Oklahoma. Seven people were arrested. Well, the state of Indiana will stop tonight as the Cinderella story continues on college basketball's biggest stage. The Indiana Hoosiers will take on Maryland tonight in the national championship game. As Indiana fans in Bloomington prepare for a party, how are Ball State students reacting to tonight's game? News Center Stacey Williams found out. I'm rooting for IU. Uh, they're at a slight disadvantage, though, because uh, Maryland's tough on defense. But if they can play a better outside game, I think they're going to win. Oh, well, I got to root for the Hoosiers. I've been waiting 15 years for this. I've always been a big IU fan, big Bob Knight fan. And uh, even though he's not around anymore, uh, he's there in spirit. And uh, he recruited most of the players that are playing on the team right now. So. Yeah, go Hoosiers. I cannot wait until Indiana wins. I just know that, that they are, even though you know, some people might not think so. I'm happy for Indiana. They're so happy, and I'm happy for them. Um, who's playing? <laughs> who's playing? All <laughs> right. So how's the weather going to be tonight? Should we stay in and watch the basketball game? Or? You know, Casey, it looks like an absolutely wonderful night to sit. Just sit at home and watch that basketball, because it looks like we're going to see some showers tonight. In fact, it looks like it's going to even continue over into the morning. But thats I'll tell you more about that later. Low of 43 tonight. Stick around. I'll have more later. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> A Portage man was arrested yesterday on more than 50 felony counts of prescription fraud. 43-year-old Kelly Dittmer was arrested at a Walgreens in Hobart after he allegedly phoned in a refill for two prescriptions under the identity of a man who died in 1992. The prescriptions were written by a Merrillville doctor for the painkiller Vicodin and tranquilizer Xanax. That same doctor assisted police in their investigation. Charges against Dittmer include 34 felonies for fraudulently obtaining controlled substances with a prior conviction and 20 felonies for fraudulently obtaining a muscle relaxant. Police say Dittmer will be held in the Lake County Jail until charges are formally filed. Crime labs in Indiana still face several years of work despite additional funding from the state. Indiana State Police say there's a huge backlog of evidence to catch up on. Lawmakers approved more than $12 million in additional funding to keep up with the numbers of cases referred to the labs. State Police Sergeant David Burson says authorities would like to be caught up within four years, but the process could take longer. Some Clark County officials say the county could be headed for bankruptcy. County officials are trying to meet a deadline for reducing its jail population to 197, 197 inmates by moving a dozen inmates. Over the past few months, the county has housed about 28 inmates over the new limit, but housing those inmates elsewhere could cost the county about $1,000 a day. 
suicide prevention program is making its way to a southern Indiana school system. The Greater Jasper School Corporation says the goal of the program is to have both staff and students trained to identify people facing serious troubles. A group of counselors and nurses were trained through the suicide prevention program last month. The elementary school staff will go through the, the program as well next fall. Up next, a suicide bomber has killed three in Jerusalem while Israel goes on the offensive. And later, with six suicide bombings in six days, how are Israelis coping with the fear? Stay tuned. Israeli police say a suicide bomb attack in Jerusalem today has injured at least three people. The explosives reportedly went off when a policeman approached the car at a checkpoint. There has been no claim of responsibility. Earlier Monday, Israeli tanks and troops opened fire on a building in Ramallah with, tanks, with tank rounds and a vehicle-mounted anti-aircraft gun. President Bush says he has been in contact with several world leaders about the conflict, urging both Palestinians and Israelis to find a path to peace. Meanwhile, President Bush is calling on Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat to stop the suicide bombings in Israel so U.S. proposals for peace can have a chance. essential for the peace of the region and the world that, uh, that we route out terrorist activities, that we condemn those activities, suicide bombers in the name of... Uh, uh, in the name of uh, religion, is simple terror. President Bush calls the string of bombings simple terror. Meanwhile, more troops and tanks have moved into the West Bank area of Palestine as Israel steps up against the suicide attacks. The Palestinians call Israel's advancement a campaign of terror. And Israel has suffered six terrorist attacks in six days. As the death toll rises, Israelis are forced to group with the reality that they could be next victims. John Voss has a report on how fear is affecting the people of Israel. Hi. Hi, guys. At home and under siege, the Levitt family, typical of so many in Israel. There's no safe anymore. Because now the suicide bombings are so random, so unpredictable. When going out at night, they eat at restaurants that are off the street and up a flight of stairs. The thinking in the head is, okay, well, if, if a terrorist comes, well, it's not right on the street, and they probably are not going to think they'd have to go up a flight of stairs. Her husband, Rana Salesman, used to have many clients in the Palestinian village of Bajala, but no more. He says it's now too dangerous to drive there. When he does take his family out, there's an ever-present fear of attack. To tell you the truth, I don't know what I'm looking for, but we're looking. Do you know what something suspicious is? You don't know until you see it. They have two teenage boys who now spend most of their free time at home with friends. You go down there and there's, there's no one. It's like, I, I feel like Jerusalem's a, a ghost city. Nancy carefully chooses her supermarket based on the level of security, especially after a suicide bombing at a Jerusalem shopping centre last week. She goes to a market that has two or three private security guards instead of only one. Looking around all the time and looking over your shoulder, looking around at the people, seeing if anybody looks suspicious. Um, before going somewhere, just looking out and seeing if there's enough security. Dr. Arya Shalev is in charge of psychiatry at Jerusalem's Hadassah Hospital. In December, he says, they treated 1,000 people for post-traumatic stress. He believes that number has more than doubled in recent months. The Israeli society is a society of denial. We have been denying threats for decades, and at this point in time, it's not working very well for us. Like many others, the Levitts say they try to live normal lives because to give in to fear, they say, is to give in to terror. But what's normal just hours after we spoke with the Levitt family came this, a car bomb in downtown Jerusalem, a familiar scene of police, ambulance crews and emergency workers. In so many ways, this is the new normality in Israel. John Vos, CNN, Jerusalem. Cars driven by the September 11th terrorists are up for auction. A Ford Escort and a Chevrolet Corsica were rented by Mohammed Atta three weeks prior to the September 11th attacks. A liquidation company will give the proceeds from the two cars to a September 11th victims fund. The cars will not be sold for profit and will be sold to a buyer in the United States. And a federal judge says prosecutors do not have to prove that John Walker had any direct involvement in the deaths of Americans in Afghanistan. Walker is accused of engaging in a broad conspiracy with the Taliban. 
Judge T.S. Ellis III says that it is the claim prosecutors must prove. Prosecutors admitted they could not prove Walker ever fired at an American during today's court hearing. Defense attorneys say Walker was tortured while in U.S. custody. Relatives of September 11th attacks in New York attended a tree planting ceremony in Woodside, Queens, New York today. Twelve saplings were planted in Calvary Cemetery overlooking the New York skyline. The trees celebrate the memory of each of the September 11th World Trade Center victims buried at Calvary Cemetery. The twelfth tree honors the memory of the other September 11th victims. The planting is a part of the Memorial Treeway of Champion Trees, a project of National Tree Trust. Jury selection got underway in the trial of a Massachusetts man accused of murdering seven co-workers. Prosecutors say Michael McDermott opened fire inside Office of Edgewater Technology on December 26 of 2000. Prosecutors say McDermott was angry at company officials for withholding his wages to pay back taxes that McDermott owed. Brian Barnett has more with the story. Michael McDermott dressed in prison garb as jury selection begins. The 42-year-old from Haverhill, also known as Mucko, is on trial for allegedly gunning down seven of his co-workers at Edgewater Technology in Wakefield the day after Christmas in 2000. Nothing at all, thank you. No comment today from McDermott's parents, but McDermott is expected to pursue an insanity defense. One piece of evidence that will likely come up in trial a book about faking mental illness, which McDermott purchased. Prosecutors are expected to argue that McDermott was studying up on how to appear insane. But the defense is expected to argue the opposite. McDermott was using the book to learn how to appear normal. More wide eyed children gathered on the White House South Lawn for the annual Easter egg roll today. President Bush personally welcomed the Easter Bunny to kick off the festivities. The children listened to Clifford and Arthur stories and also had the opportunity to shake hands with Barney, Elmo, and Jimmy Neutron, boy genius. Rutherford B. Hayes was the first president to hold the egg roll on the White House lawn back in 1878. So how was that weather today for those kids in that Seemed Easter awfully, egg roll? awfully warm there over in Washington, D.C., but... Yeah, meeting here. Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, what more could you want? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, Ryan Miller, weatherman genius extraordinaire, is back with your weather right after this. <laughs> Well, it certainly wasn't an April Fool's joke out there today. Welcome back to News Center 43. Today's high, 49 degrees, just a shade under our normal high of 55. Unfortunately, it did bottom out below freezing, though. 30 degrees for the low. Normally, we only see 23, though, so really, we got the better end of the deal. If you'd like to get up to see the sun come up tomorrow morning, you should head outside at about 624, and then the sun will be going down at about 707. So if we go ahead and hit those state maps, we can see exactly what it looked like around the state of Indiana today. 52 there in Indianapolis. Actually, that should say 50 up there for Muncie and 44 up there in South Bend, along with 63 down there for Evansville. They saw just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful day down there along the Ohio River. So in fact, let's go ahead and hit that next map if we could. Thank you very much. Here's what the national satellite looks like. You can see that there's a whole bunch of clouds out there all the way back into Montana. And really right now, it looks like we're gonna see that for the next couple of days. So in fact, if we hit the next radar, we can go ahead and take those clouds out. We'll go ahead and put that precipitation in there. And you can see this really thin line of snow where it turns over into rain. Luckily, we're not gonna see any of that snow, but this rain we are seeing right now. And really, it looks like we're probably gonna uh, keep that into, well, sometime tomorrow morning, probably ending around 9.30, 10 o'clock or so. Other than that low, it doesn't look like it's uh, very bad. Currently though, that should, that's wrong. Sorry about that. That should say that the rain is here and we are seeing temperatures of 36 degrees outside right now. Pretty calm westerly wind though. So really not too bad out there if you don't mind the rain. So in fact, here's what's gonna happen tonight. We've got this cold front that's about to come down across us. This. Uh, dome of low pressure here, that's going to move down to the southeast, kind of tre start trekking that way, and with it is going to come that area of precipitation. Like I just said, that's going to stick around at least until 9.30, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and that cold front there, like I just said, that is going to cool us off just a little bit, nothing to get really too concerned about, just a little cool down a little bit. So here's the lows for tonight. You can see Muncie kind of sits right there on that line between the 40s to our south and the 30s to our north. So here in Muncie, let's go ahead and expect to see about 43 degrees with the rain arriving 
for the morning hours make your uh, drive or walk to school, well, actually quite wet. And in fact, for tomorrow afternoon, you can see that that cold front's already moved on by us. You can see the snow there. I don't think the snow is going to happen though, because we're going to keep temperatures above freezing for the most part tomorrow. Other than that, it looks like it should be not too bad of a day. In fact, tomorrow's high is some 50s for much of the state. So actually some, yeah, some 50s, sorry about that. Some 30s up in the Chicago area and some 30s down there around the Evansville area. Right here in Muncie though, we could see a possible thunderstorm Probably not real likely though. Temperature of 43 degrees with a light westerly wind. And for the three-day forecast on Wednesday, let's go ahead and call for some partly sunny skies. A high of 47 degrees on Thursday. The sun is going to come back out with a vengeance. Oh, let's go ahead and call that 48 degrees with a low of 29. And then on Friday, we're going to top out at 52. I like those weather conditions. Sunny sky. <laughs> I like the sun. Like the sun. <laughs> no rain hopefully, and no snow for a while. Yeah, hopefully no snow pops up on us, yes. like just surprisingly. So be. that's really good. Thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. We're now joined with uh, Jason Matthews with Sports. Jason, obviously the big game tonight. What do you have for us? Uh, that's right. Well, we have a little uh, IU Maryland action, a little Ball State volleyball action. We'll be back with that and more right after this break. The Indiana Hoosiers may be a better shooting team than the Maryland Terrapins, but no player has been better going in tonight's NCAA championship game than Maryland guard Juan Dixon. Indiana doesn't need to shut down Dixon, but Fife's ability to slow Dixon down will dictate which team wins. Another person that has a lot to do with this matchup is Indiana coach Mike Davis. He knew when he took over for Bobby Knight that it was going to be a tough act to follow, but he seems to have done all right, and the players say they are his team, not Knight's. team is more, you know, unified and more of a family than any team I've been on since I've been here. I think Coach Davis is a very open coach. You know, he'll tell you what he's thinking, and, and you can go to him and ask him questions and find out what's going on, and, uh, you know, that really makes it more comfortable as a player. Just to see the smile on all, everybody's face, you know, again, and we know it's been a while. Davis has brought change in result and in feeling, in performance, and in philosophy. I'm similar to any other coach. I want to win. But I try not to embarrass the guy. He's fun to play for. You can come, come to him and ask him questions when you have anything that, you know, you think we can do better and give him suggestions, and he, and he listens to that. Just a much looser atmosphere outside of practice. Inside of practice, there's, as far as intensity goes, there's not a whole lot of difference except that maybe Coach Davis doesn't yell quite as much. We consider ourselves Coach Davis's players now. This is just a transition that we had to make. People that like Coach Davis before like him a little bit more. Those that hate him probably still hate him. But for the majority of people, they can appreciate and respect a man that works as hard and does what he does. They may not necessarily like him, but they respect him. What we're trying to do is win a national championship for Indiana. And if we win a national championship, and when they put it up on the boundary, it, it, it won't say Mike Davis, it, it won't say Coach Knight, it just say Indiana. The Hoosiers and Terrapins are currently playing the national championship game on CBS. Baseball season has started again. Today, two old-time rivals helped to get it underway. The Reds and Cubs faced off today at Synergy Field in Cincinnati. Ken Griffey Jr. gets the Reds going early with this looping fly ball to left field and got the Reds' first RBI of the season by bringing in Todd Walker for an early 1-0 lead. Then in the second with Jr. on second, Sean Casey gets a base knock to the left side, and that's enough to get Junior home when Roosevelt Brown's throw sails high. Delino DeShields then got the Cubs on the board with a nice little base hit to score Alex Gonzalez and bring the Cubs back into the game. But in the end, the Reds were too much, pounding out 12 hits on Cub pitching and winning the first game of the series 5-4. The Ball State men's volleyball team won its third straight match this weekend as they defeated number 11 Ohio State. This is the second time this season the Cards have knocked off the Buckeyes. Leading the charge for Ball State was Kyle Wendell and Matt Denmark, who combined for a total of 13 blocks on the night. The Cards only have four regular season games remaining and will be in action at number 12 Loyola on April the 5th. And in the NCAA Women's Championship, Connecticut committed 21 turnovers, too short of its season high, 
was 0 for 9 on three-point shots. And all that did was force the Huskies to find another way to win it. And when they did, by overpowering the Oklahoma Sooners inside, Connecticut beat Oklahoma 82-70 to Sunday night to conclude its second unbeaten season with the third national championship. UConn's Swin Cash was selected the outstanding player in the Final Four. And then there was light. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the game is just now, of course, getting underway, but do you have a, who you think is going to win? Are you, you know what? The way IU's been playing lately, uh, anybody really has a chance. What do you guys think? I'm going to stay with oh, you I'm on for that IU one. all the way. You're for Stick IU. Whether I know team. whether they're going to win or not, but <laughs> I'm for them. Thanks a lot, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Jason. And up next on News Center, Ryan Miller will have a final look at weather. Stay tuned. And I'm sure it's hot down in Georgia right now, but uh, Ryan, you're here with the last look of the weather. Oh, it's probably hot down there, just the pure tension, hey? Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> here in Muncie, though, no, not too bad of a tomorrow morning, anyhow, if you don't mind the rain. Looks like it's going to bottom out around 43. Temperatures rising after that, though. The rain is going to be here uh, pretty much all day, though. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, we could see a thunderstorm. Probably not real likely, but we could see one. Uh, look for a high, actually, of about 48 tomorrow. And for your three-day forecast, Wednesday, have a high of 47, partly sunny skies. On Thursday, we'll top out at 48, and then Friday, we should break the 50 barrier. Okay, so we can break out those sandals and shorts and bathing suits and stuff? If you want to do that, you can, Casey. <laughs> no, probably we shouldn't. I don't know, but I'm ready to put my coat away. Yes, That you can it. do. All mm -hmm. right, I'm, I'm holding you to that. I promise. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Well, thanks for joining us for News Center at 9.30. I'm Chad Wally. And I'm Casey Cavalt. News Center 43 is an official CNN Student Bureau. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for News Center at 5.30. Good night.